Hello everyone, DM Cashbad here, and today we're going to be making some of these lovely graffiti covered wooden fences. I originally made these for the Ghostbusters board game, but they'd work just fine for any modern or post-apocalyptic game that you'd like to do, like Marvel Universe Miniatures game, Batman Miniature game, The Walking Dead, County Road Z, Perilous Tales, anything that would fit into this general time frame. Even sci-fi games I think would be okay if you're doing sort of a rough future. Our main ingredients are going to be these coffee stirrer sticks and these long match sticks. So to start with, we're gonna grab a couple of these coffee stirrer sticks. I'm going to lop off one of the rounded ends of one of these. And I want my fences to be about an inch and three quarters high. So I'm gonna cut out one of these at an inch and three quarters. If you're using a smaller scale than 28 millimeter, you might go a little smaller. If you're using a larger scale, like say Marvel Crisis Protocol, you might go a little bit bigger, but an inch and three quarters look pretty good for the game I was playing. So that's what we're going for. So I just marked inch and three quarters. Put that off like that. And now I'm gonna use that as a template to cut the rest of them. i make myself a more even edge there. Lie that on top. Line up my scissors top edge. Chop off another one. There we go, now I've got two. Put the new one aside. Get the end of this again. Pop that off. There we go. And so now I just gotta make a million more of those. Well, it turns out I needed a lot less than a million of these. So because I've made these before, I know generally what I want. And so I made a stack of 20 of those planks for the long fences and a stack of 14 for the short fences and some extras just in case. So on the Ghostbusters board game, you've got these tiles and like you can see, you can see you have a long fence and you have one that's not quite as long. So I'm gonna make one of each for my project. Now, as for the length of how long I'm actually gonna make them, looks like what I did was that I made them about the width of the board, minus a little bit, just in case I needed to set them up and half of the width of one fence was gonna be in the way. So what was the length that I ended up using here? Let me just find out really quick. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Looks like about five and an eighth. So I'm gonna get out my long matchsticks. I'm going to chop off the end because I don't need to set my train projects on fire. And then I'm going to measure out five and an eighth. Let me even that up a little bit. There you go, that'll be the top beam for my longer fence. And the shorter fence, what did I end up using? About three and three quarters. So now what I've done is I've taken my planks and I've lined them up nice and straight, close together. And so I'll take my top stick like this, and you'll notice that it's a little bit shorter than what I've got. So I'm gonna take this end plank here. I'm just gonna take a little bit off of it. Cut down. There, about like that. And you don't have to make sure everything is perfect because there'll be time to trim excess and move things around uh, later on. So now I've got my stick. I'm going to line it up the way I want. Be aware that these matchsticks do sometimes have warps in them. So I'm going to put it along the top. I'm going to use regular white glue for that. So that's the side that I want. Run a bead along there. Put 
place it about like that. And I can go ahead and do that for the next one. So after letting that dry up a little bit, it's now time to make some support posts. So for the small fence, I used three. For the longer fence, I used four. And they're just gonna fit in right like that. So I measured out how much that is, and it's a little over one and a half. So let's call it something like one inch and nine sixteenths. And so I'm gonna cut off another one of my long matchstick segments. Something like that. Let's see how well that goes. Eh, you know, I think I can do, just do one and a half and be pretty happy about that. So I'm gonna trim that down. Yeah, it looks better. So now I'll use that as a template and I'll cut, what do I need? Uh, six more of these, six more. And so that no one has to suffer with watching me try to do fractions on camera, I've gone and marked out the center point on here and an evenly spaced two marks on here where the posts will go. And so now I can just run some white glue along the ugliest side of these matchsticks and attach them in like so. Yeah, there's a good ugly side. And now, because again, I don't trust my ability to do fractions, I'm gonna measure out some lengths of the matchstick to go in between the support posts. And we're gonna cut those out and I'm gonna place them a little over a quarter of an inch of the way up, you know, something like five sixteenths. Once those are dry, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get a nice sharp Zacto knife, and I'm going to go along the top and the bottom. I'm just going to even out, even out the the planks so that they sit flat and look nice and uniform. And I'm going to try and go careful. And you know, not, not break the whole thing. Just trim it up so that it looks nice. So here those are. Now, normally what I would do at this point is that I would make a base out of plastic hard or hardboard and just attach that on there, add some ground cover, and call it a day. The thing is with the Ghostbusters board game is that you've got these tiles, right? And one side is grass, and one side is asphalt and sidewalk and stuff like that. And sometimes these fences, since they're on the edge of the tiles, sometimes they are next to a grass tile on the other side, and sometimes they're next to a concrete tile on the other side. And so I didn't want to make a base and have one be green and one be gray because sometimes that wouldn't make any sense. I could have tried to just do a neutral color, like a brown or something like that. Eh, it didn't really, really appeal to me. So instead what I'm doing is making these little stands. I'm just gonna take some scrap pieces of the coffee stir sticks or the match sticks and I'm going to lean them up casually against one side of the fence so that when you place it down, it'll stand up. And since we've got a square grid and the bases are round, if I put the stands around where the spaces, you know, around the lines separating the two squares, they won't get in the way of the models as long as I don't make them too big and intrusive. So I'm gonna line up my fence a little bit like that. And I'm just gonna break off a bit of my uh, a spare stir stick, kind of like that. Get maybe another one. There we go. Let's see. Got a little glue. Touch this. About right there. I have to put another one in there. Okay. 
<laughs> Something like that. Okay, line this up. Over there, glob there, and just grease it. There. And so I do that on the other side, and that should stand up. Alternatively, what I've done for support for some of these is I've used little bits of urban furniture and some resin pieces that I've collected over the years. Got a little trash bag on that one, a barrel over here, a tire on one of these. Where'd it go? Oh yeah, right there. So, you know, you can use those to stand in for supports if you like. I've also just made small um, piles of gravel or rocks and what I do for those is I just cut out a little piece of plastic card like you see right here so I cut out this little triangular wedge like that and I'm just gonna apply some glue to stick it to the fence and like that and then Add a little bit more glue to the surface of it. And then cover it with different grains of sand and rocks. So I'll put some big ones down first. There we go. A couple more. There you go. And then some lighter sand like that. And that'll work as a support too. So there the fences are all modeled and ready to paint and the first thing I'm going to do is hit it with a little spray primer. I'm using the nice fancy GW Chaos Black. It's a little expensive but I've got almost a full can. These aren't very big and it will preserve the wood grain a little better but in a pinch you can definitely use regular Rust-Oleum spray cans. As long as you don't cake it on too thick it should look fine. So we're going to start with making the fences brown. There's a lot of ways you can paint these. There are much more efficient ways you can do this sort of thing, including just dipping it in some kind of wood stain. But I use the old method, so that's what I'm going to show you here. Do whatever works for you. I'm going to start with a base coat of burnt umber mixed with black. I use these Delta Ceram Coat craft paints for this project because that's what I use for every project. And we're just going to make a slightly darker shade and then apply that to the entire model. That's good. The next thing I do is add a black wash to the whole piece and that's of course just a little black paint thinned down with a whole lot of water. Now I'm going to do five dry brush layers on top of these. Five is kind of excessive. You could get away with a lot fewer just making your transitions a little lighter, going, going lighter faster, but what can I say? This is my process. This is the way I've always done it, so I'm just gonna stick with that. So, the first dry brush layer is going to be with just burnt umber. Now I do a lighter dry brush of brown iron oxide, then spice brown, then spice brown mixed with some trail tan, and a final light dusting of spice brown mixed with even more trail tan pile is going to be done in a similar way. First a base coat of rain gray mixed with some charcoal, then a charcoal wash, then five levels of dry brush starting with rain gray mixed with a little charcoal, then straight rain gray, then two levels using rain gray mixed with increasing amounts of drizzle gray, and then just straight drizzle gray. 
finally, I'm just going to add a couple spots of thinned down burnt umber just to give the ground a little more grime. Get to what you're probably all here to see some proper 1980s graffiti for our Ghostbusters fences. I'm not real familiar with the style, so I had to go onto Google Image Search and look up 1980s graffiti, and that gave me some, some good examples that I could pull from. Obviously, you don't have to do this, you can make up your own, you can freehand it, whatever. I just I felt like it'd be more authentic if I looked up actual images, and I found a couple that I liked. So once I did that, I went and redrew them onto a piece of paper just so I knew what I was getting into, got myself familiar with the layout. And so I'm going to start one of them. So for a lot of these, they start with a little cloudy background. Uh, they just put down some color to, um, to make the rest of the lettering stand out. And I think it works really well with these fences, which are kind of a a neutral color to begin with. So because for this one, the cloud kind of follows the shape of the letters, I'm just going to rough in about where the letters go. I don't have to be real exact with this at this stage. I'm just giving myself a general idea of how these go so that I can add in the background. And then we kind of got this letter right here, like that. Okay, so that's about how big our first graffiti is going to go. So now I'm just going to expand it out a little bit. And this bright yellow that I'm using, it's already pretty thin, but I'm adding a little bit more water to it because this is spray paint and it doesn't go on in an even thick coat depending on how much uh, paint you still have in the can. It could be lighter, how far away it is, that kind of thing. So I'm just taking an old brush and just working out a, a thin cloud for our letters to go on. Once that's done, I now can go in with my good brush and start the actual work of drawing in these letters. And I'm just going to draw the outline. I'm going to take this brighter red, this Tompe red, and I'm going to go through and I'm going to try and just carefully put out the outlines of the graffiti that I'm working with. Again, this there is room for error on this. You don't have to do it perfectly. We're going to go over and outline these in black. If you make a mark where you don't want it, you can always cover it up with a little yellow or brown, depending on where it goes. And no one's going to criticize you if it's not exactly like the image that you were using. So, you know... Uh, just try and find a line, a shape, an angle, and replicate that. And then move on to the next connecting line. If they don't quite line up, then adjust them as you need to. And just, uh, yeah, just don't worry too much about it. You're just trying to get the feel. No one's going to sit down at the game table and read this stuff. So now I've got the letters traced out and filled in. And so now, like I said, I'm going to go over in black and again with the nice brush. And I'm going to just give them a black outline to make them stand out. And if you are familiar with 3D lettering, then you're ahead of the game. But we're going to add a little bit of that, too. So if you're not familiar then all you have to do to make 3D letters is to just choose a side of the letters. So for example, the lower left, which is what I'm going to be doing. And then, so on sides that aren't the lower left, you make a nice thin line. And sides that are the lower left, you make them a little bit thicker, like this. Now, before you do the 
black lining on this, a lot of graffiti letters have a fade of colors. So for example, they'll be darker at the bottom and go to a lighter color on top. So I would have done that if I were doing that in this case. So I could have done like a yellow on the top, just gone over the places that I painted red at the top with, uh, you know, like an orange or a darker red or like a purple down at the bottom. But these are just going to be a little bit more straightforward. So I'm not gonna do that step on this particular one. So now I've got that about to where I want it. There are a couple of extra details that I do want to include. So there are these little blocks that come out from the design on some of the serifs of the letters. So I'm gonna add those in much the same way. I'm gonna draw a little block like that. And then I'm gonna um, outline it in black. So there's also some coming off from the corner of this S type character one like that and then I think I'm going to expand the yellow cloud out a little bit give that a little bit more room take up more of the fence and that'll mostly be it so there that's how that turned out now that's for the more elaborate graffiti you do of course have some more simple tags and the way I like to do that is to take some black and I like to thin it down a little bit to, you know, kind of feather in the letters. Don't make it so stark because again, aerosol spray cans. And also I do, even for these, like to go on to Google Image Search and pick out real examples. So for those, I can just rough in little letters wherever they'll fit. To add a little more uh, simpler street art to the scene. And it's just drawing these using thin black. And of course I can always go in and make it darker and that doesn't look too bad lighter out on the edges and darker in the middle like a spray can would produce. So now we have all our graffiti painted. You can see I've done a couple of variations for some of these. Sometimes I do little tags in different colors. Sometimes it's more like scribbles. On this one here, I did the 3D lettering with a different color with a couple darker stripes just to give it a little added flair. Again, I'm copying this from a, an image from Google Image Search. And more the same, I had a cartoon character for the cloud on the back of this one. I put in uh, fire instead of, you know, just a, just a background of color. But I think you get the idea. The last thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna add some posters to the other side. Primarily I'm doing this because on the board game tiles, that's what seems to be on there. They have a bunch of these little flyers and notices. And so we're gonna replicate that. The first thing that I went to do is I went online again, and I just did a search for uh, posters. They have a bunch of these that you can download for model train stuff and things like that. And uh, here, I'll show you a selection that I've got there. I'll just cut those out movie posters, things that are too hard to read. Some of these are old timey, some of them are sci-fi, but you'll never know from the scale that they're at. I can't even read them. But one thing about them is that for a couple of them, they're a little too white and clean, having been printed on regular typing paper. So I'm gonna take some very thin washes of brown or yellow, and I'm just gonna apply a little bit to these, because these have been sitting out like in a park for a while, and they shouldn't be so clean. When you do this, it will tend to smear the ink that you uh, that you printed these with, but that's okay. Again, no one's gonna read these. I'm just gonna add a little yellow, a little brown, maybe even a little of both, just for a little added realism. 
While those are drawing, I went and cut out a couple of rectangles from regular typing paper because I want to make my own. Google can't do all the work for me. So these are going to be, you know, like hand-drawn posters or flyers that people uh, put up. In fact, on one of these, I'm going to score some lines down at the bottom edge of this one here to make, you know, those tear-off phone number tags that you sometimes see, or used to. Anyway, something like that. Here we go. And then I'll paint them a selection of bright colors, because people, you know, advertising their bands or their car wash or their lost dog or whatever would want this to stand out. So let's, you know, make one pink. Well, I don't need to show you this whole thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a selection here. I'm gonna make one yellow. I'm gonna make one pink. I'm gonna do a blue one. We'll check in after I put that base color down. Here's another extremely unnecessary step. Once that base coat is dry, I've gone and I've mixed in a little white to the standard color. And I'm just gonna go in with a very light highlight almost a dry brush into the middle. Again, just to give it a little variety of tone, make it look a little faded. So now I'm gonna go in and add some text on our posters. And as much as possible when I do these, I like to actually try and write the words. You're probably not going to be able to read them, but I think it does make a difference um, when you actually try and write the text as opposed to just making little dashed lines or scribbles or something. Even if it ends up being about the same when all said and done. Um, so for this text, uh, for, sorry, for this color that I'm using, I'm not using straight black. I figure the, the, the black ink would fade just like the paper does, so I actually mixed in a little white to make a gray. Just just so it doesn't look so stark with the rest of the stuff. And so I can do some text. I can put in, you know, they might have added a picture to some of these. I'll just draw. You'll only really be able to see the light and the black. This would be a black and white copy on colored paper, so I don't really need to color in anything. And I think you get the idea. With that, the only thing left to do is to start attaching our posters to the backs of the fences using a little white glue. And then our job is done. We just hit the whole project with the spray-on matte varnish of your choice. And we'll check back in with you when everything's set. And so there you have it. A bunch of brand new wooden fences covered in graffiti and posters for the board game or miniature war game of your choice. Leave a comment down below if you have any questions, observations, or concerns, and I will see you on the next one.